So yesterday we had our first real day of hot summer. So it got to about 34 degrees. Here we are in early June. And I was very heartened sailing to this island because the boat was surrounded by more than two dozen dolphins, a huge pod. And that happens so rarely these days. I haven't seen dolphins except in singles in, uh, in months and months. Almost a year now, actually, that I've seen a pod that, that big. So the oceans uh, really have been fished out and it's getting harder and harder for the, the dolphins to survive. I think the marine life is under stress because of uh, anthropogenic overuse of all these resources. So we really, really are in a predicament. We're in a deep forest. And I think we probably want to spend some time attempting to get out of this forest. We shouldn't be spending our last day saying we're lost in this forest. We're going to die here. I think we should be working towards some kind of solution. I think that there's no way out of this forest. It looks like we're too deeply entrenched and embedded. But it would be foolish not to try and see if there was a way out. And so that's kind of what I've been doing in these uh, last few videos is exploring if there is any escape. I think the, the best attitude to take is that there's no escape, but we'll try anyway. If we really are lost in this deep forest, the only way to get out is to backtrack, to go over how we got here. Now, I realize there's a big conspiracy to say, you know, why are you so focused on race and ethnicity? Why are you bringing up these subjects about gender? Can't we just not name and shame and blame and, and you know, just face the fact that we're stuck in a forest and go from here? No, you have to figure out how you got here and then you can backtrack. So you have to go over all these unpleasant things that they've spent a lot of time and effort, especially in places like America. There's a conspiracy to say, you know, gender doesn't exist. It's not real. Race doesn't exist. Don't talk about all these things like religion. We, there's a conspiracy to say we must stay unified because otherwise the whole prosperity cult in America falls apart. So it's like we can make this, you know, this project of the alien cortex, the prosperity cult, industrialization work. Just don't bring the lower brain into it. Don't bring the mammalian brain into it. Don't bring the reptilian brain into it. We want to keep this purely alien cortex, no primate brain involved. And if it's just purely intellectual, we all subliminate all our lower natures, then we can make this project work. Now, hidden in this conspiracy of getting out of the forest by somehow not facing how we got into it is buried the fact that the alien cortex knows that the villain in all of this, the villain that got us into the forest, is the alien cortex. And somewhere deep down, it knows that getting out of the forest means murdering it on the spot and then finding our way back. And so it twists and turns. It's a weasley, weedly thing. And what it's trying to do is trying to wriggle out of the fact that it's responsible for where we've got to. So unfortunately, we have to go over this, this area of how we got here. And that's why I was introducing the Aryans and religion. And that's why we'll go much deeper into how we got into this predicament so we can tease apart this Gordian knot. Now, we finished last time in Egypt. And what I was presenting is really the Industrial Revolution comes from the Aryans. This is where we're going with all of this. This Apollonian ideal, this hyper-masculinity, this patriarchal, militaristic uh, culture that we've inherited, that we dominate nature, that we fish out the seas, that we absolutely exploit the earth, came from the Aryans. This is where you can trace it to. It's not politically correct, but unfortunately, history is not politically correct. The whole impetus to make history political, politically correct and to try and live a politically correct myth is largely to cover over the blame for how we got here. And if we don't blame and shame how we got here, we'll never get out. The reason is that the blame all lies with our alien cortex. 
and this conspiracy not to blame anybody is really trying, the alien cortex trying to let itself off the hook. Well, let's go back and build the case against the alien cortex and start with the Aryans. So this is not an exercise in an academic thing for one-upmanship. Who can figure out what the past was? I know more than you. I know botany. I know history. I know ethnology. I'm a, you know, some expert in the field. And then we play this little um, uh, game where we, we do this kind of parlor game of, uh, of where we play chess against each other and see who knows more. Alien cortex against alien cortex. And, uh, you know... Who trumps who? It's not that game. This is a game of building a legal case against the alien cortex. So it's a balance of probable e evidence. It's not like, it's not, uh, say, what a historian would say is like, there's not enough evidence, so we can't say, we have to put it aside. No, you don't get to do that in a court case. You figure out what's the most reasonable path that actually happened, or what's the most reasonable uh, hypothesis that explained what happened on the night of the crime and then you reconstruct as best you can and the available evidence says either guilty or not guilty in this case the murder is right there in front of you the alien cortex is red-handed and now I'm building the case against it it starts with the Aryans it must do uh, their, their fingerprint is everywhere. I told you how they were in Egypt, and I told you about Set. Now, I said Set was your alien cortex, but Set is also death. So the fight between Horus and Set is also a fight against death. It's all really about the alien cortex running away from death, and it's run into this forest where it will die miserably trying to escape death. So you can't escape death, but there are good deaths and bad deaths. A death of escape in the forest is a bad death. Um, now, this is repeated so often in the mythology, the whole ethos. If, if you look at Attis and Sibylle, and Attis tried to run away from Sibylle. Sibylle is also set. She's the female version, in, and she's death. Now, you might think I'm overloading too many things on set. Uh, you know, how can he be the alien cortex and death? Well, death comes with our alien cortex. It's a package deal. Our alien cortex allowed us to see death. So death is kind of a myth because it's impossible to experience. It's really hypothetical. Uh, when you actually experience death, uh, it's an experience that's probably outside of what you normally conceive of death. So getting close to death and dying is not the way you normally conceive of death when you're running away from it. So this, this myth of a death head in the sky is actually God, by the way. It's Yahweh, uh, Allah, uh, is, uh, is actually the male version of Sibylle so, and Set. So Set is also God. I'm not overloading too many things on this one subject. Uh, it really is um, a complex nexus and it becomes, uh, it, it came about because the alien cortex could look ahead, perceive our own personal deaths and started to work against it. So it's a heroic effort um, in, in terms of fighting off the inevitable. So. If you look at the story of Sibylle and Attis, you can see the same, the same thing. And you can see that with Set and Osiris. Um, and it's getting more elaborate as, as it goes on uh, until it eventually becomes the, the myth of, uh, say, um, the technological singularity. That's our latest version of, uh, of this crazy, crazy story that goes back to when the alien cortex first perceives death and it gives it anxiety. Uh, it motivates it. It motivates it for religion, for philosophy, for technical uh, expertise, and for culture. So, let's <coughs> go back to the other branch of the Aryans, the branch that went to India. Now, as soon as you get to the Aryans in India, you run into 
Indian ethno-nationalism, as I mentioned before. They absolutely hate the idea of an area invasion. Indian scholars have convinced themselves that there was no militaristic uh, Aryan invasion. They don't know about the recent uh, Y chromosomal DNA evidence that says, no, it certainly was um, a hostile invasion. So let's go back all the way in India to what the Aryans found when they invaded. They invade the Indus Valley, they come into Harappa, and they conquer it. Militaristically, this is what they always do, kind of genocidal people. Our species is, is fairly genocidal, but they, uh, the Aryans are especially genocidal. So they sweep in in their chariots with their, their horses, um, probably displaced by something like the flood, a great flood uh, from their original homeland, which I think was probably under the Black Sea. Um, and then what do they find in, in India? Well, the prevailing culture is Dravidian, but India is very interesting because, as I mentioned before, you can piece together our cultural history, our religious history, and our philosophical history because it's a kind of layer cake. It has these strata of archaeology which you can tease apart. Now, there's a big conspiracy, again, this conspiracy of, like, don't consider how we got into the forest, just take it from here. Uh, the Indian version of that is, uh, no, everything happened locally. But you can see there were successive invasions which are very useful for doing this cultural archaeology because uh, you can also include the genetic evidence. So the very first people to people India were dark-skinned. They were, uh, you can see particularly with the Tamils. Now they've traced genetically, they've traced that, uh, the origins to the Australasians, uh, the Austral, or rather the Aborigines. So the Austral um, Aborigines um, probably trekked round the coast from Africa. And if you look at the Tamils in particular today, if you look at the lower castes in India, uh, especially the Dalits, the ones that don't even have a caste, the outcasts, the untouchables, those ones, are, they look, even to the eye, they look like Aborigines. They're dark-skinned. Now, if you look in the religion of India, you'll see that the older religions that the Indians found uh, were of dark skin. So you, you, you have Krishna, which means the blue one or the dark one. He's, he's clearly one of the indigenous inhabitants that they fused into the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita is all about Krishna. And what the Aryans are doing is a bit of spinning. They're, doing a, uh, they're taking one of the local gods and then re-spinning a story it's propaganda for occupiers. So it's imperialist propaganda. And you'll see in the Bhagavad Gita now, <clears throat> any Indian historian, his head's already exploded for what I've said before. But anyway, we'll push on because I do believe this to be the truth and we can backfill it later. I, I don't want to get into uh, nitty gritty arguments with an alien cortex that doesn't want to be exposed. And uh, the alien cortex has a lot of scopophobia. That means a fear of being looked at. So a lot of the pushback that you get, uh, particularly with Indo-nationalism, is a fear of the alien cortex of looking at itself. So its um, self-examination is, it understands that that's basically going to cause its uh, conviction and its prosecution. So that's part of the conspiracy to not look at India as the way it obviously is. And so then that's part of all the denialism of its actual history that's particularly prevalent in, in pundits and scholars in India itself. Okay, so the, the thing that would really make, uh, I think, a lot of people's head explode is the idea that, that A, Krishna is a Dravidian god, he is, uh, to that uh, they, they took him, uh, appropriated him out of the Dravidian's religion and made uh, myths around him to support the occupation of a foreign country, India, um, as imperialists. And so very cunning way of doing it, you make the centerpiece of the Mahabharata is the Gita, the most sacred book probably uh, for Hindus, and you put this foreign god, you appropriate him, uh, and you weave a story around him, and the outcome is, yes, uh, the castes are sacred. Um, you must, uh, it's all about Dharma and telling the truth, all the kind of things that you would like as a slaveholder and an occupier. Uh, so, 
um, then they take the idea, I think there must have been the idea of reincarnation with the Dravidians. Um, the, the, the Aryans seem to have a view of the afterlife that you see in Egypt. It's not reincarnation. Uh, it's just um, an afterlife. They take the idea of the Dravidians' um, reincarnation because it's very convenient. It's saying like, if you have a caste system, you're on the bottom, that's because you don't have enough merit. You don't have enough karmic merit. But if you work as a slave, you carry enough water, if we can abuse you enough, if we can rape you enough, then you will accumulate good karma, and then you can rise up the caste through rebirths. Um, and then, you know, that keeps everybody in their place and um, keeps everybody working on the treadmill. And we inherit that in the West today, the same thing. You just keep working on that treadmill and one day in the casino gulag you will reach the top and then that, it's, it's a conservative uh, myth uh, for, to keep imperialists uh, in place, to keep the, um, the elites uh, on the top. And the elites are the Brahmins. Um, and so the caste system, uh, the, has them at the top that basically they the scholars and the pundits and the priests and so they don't do any work by the way and they have you know prima nocta rights they massively paternal um, and it's hard to imagine a regime that's more masculine and oppressive of women um, for example uh, according to the laws of Manu laws of Manu is laws of man the Aryans um, you know copy book for for uh, the Aryans rule book, uh, essentially, um, and they, the rules of man are especially harsh to a woman. So in, a, in, in law, then a woman would be worth half a man. And a woman could never become realized. The goal of life, of course, is realization, self-realization, but a woman could never become realized. She could only become realized through her husband, and her husband was her absolute master and guru. Uh, when he died, uh, then she was supposed to shave her head, become a nun, uh, wear white, go to uh, live in a, essentially a convent for the rest of her life. Uh, you can clearly see that, you know, the Brahmins, they don't like the thought of their wife sleeping with some other man after they're dead, so they insist they become nuns. Uh, and then there's also an element of protection. You can imagine that they don't want their wives um, maybe rubbing their husbands out. Um, prematurely uh, to escape this uh, authoritarian, authoritarian yoke. So then they too um, have a vested interest in making sure that the, um, the wives are not too keen that the husband dies and then you get sati and things, these impetus to say that you, know, the, you, you should kill yourself when, uh, when the husband um, passes away. You should you know, jump on the funeral pyre. Now what the Aryans found in India in terms of religion and philosophy was uh, the Dravidians and then, you know, gods like Krishna, um, uh, Shiva, uh, masculine gods. So the Dravidians were already turning a bit masculine. And the Dravidians um, were probably invaders themselves. Uh, the oldest culture of all, maybe the Dalits, and the, those are the untouchables, and the lowest caste, uh, the Shudra, you know, the workers, the menial laborers, the darker skinned kind of people, um, the original indigenous inhabitants, uh, their religion is still thriving um, in India. None of the superseding invasions managed to wipe out the culture of the preceding one. What they did in general was just to syncretize it and fuse it into this new culture of oppression, increasing oppression up until the, uh, the Brahmins and the Aryan invasion, and then finally the Muslim invasion, which was, um, it was not entirely successful. Yeah, the Muslim invasion was probably the most onerous, um, probably not nearly as bad as the British invasion, which was the final one. So, back to the Dalits and the original indigenous inhabitants and what their religion was. So their religion is the religion of Kali, the mother goddess. So Kali is dark-skinned and I think she's a great exemplar of what the religion of the shamans, uh, the universal religion, all the way back to our exodus from Africa, must have been something like the Kali religion. So. Uh, she is supposed to have sprung from the head of Durga. Uh, uh, Durga, I think, is probably the succeeding generation, or she's 
Kylie's been incorporated into her, and of course she ha uh, Durga has precedence because, again, the same trick as the Aryans did was you, you fold in uh, the old goddess uh, into the new religion for political reasons and you make the new religion supersede the old one. So then, you know, you have uh, Kali springing from the forehead of Durga. Now, the reason she springs from the forehead of Durga is to show that Durga is the, the real goddess and the original one, of, but of course it, it's really Kali. So Durga herself, uh, she's plainly Sibylle. Uh, her mount is a tiger and or lioness is exactly the same as um, as Sibylle. Sibylle has a chariot because of course that it gets um, it gets twisted later by the Aryans and the Aryans have chariots so they have uh, the Aryan twist on on uh, Durga she's um, she still has lionesses pulling a chariot but they insert the, the the Aryan chariot in. Durga normally doesn't have a chariot she's she's uh, riding lionesses. The lioness, I think, is the uh, oldest animist representation of the mother goddess. So the reason for that is the lioness is well worth a primate having as a god. When we were in Africa, essentially we were just cat food on the African plain. And if anything shaped us, it was be uh, predatory cats. So, uh, in particularly something like a, a black panther that can, um, you know, climb through uh, rockeries uh, where we probably lived in the, in the Rift Valley. The idea of a black cat must be very deeply embedded in our brains. Uh, it must be wired up through millions of years of evolution because essentially we were just you know, the food for predatory cats for most of, uh, you know, the 4.3 million years of hominid existence, we, we were just feeding cats. Now, that's a very important part of our story because cats for us must have at one stage represented the likely way of dying. So they are the quintessential essential representation of death. They also, the thing that shaped us so the fact that we have uh, such good pattern recognition is probably so we can see predatory cats moving in foliage. The mere fact that uh, you can probably do mathematics today uh, is probably uh, very likely an offshoot of that pattern recognition. So that comes down to, to cats. Even um, the, our color vision might have more to do <coughs> with um, picking out fruits and berries than it does with uh, identifying uh, camouflage in, in cats. We, we are exceptionally good at uh, picking out uh, anything that might look like a face, um, eyes, or uh, movement like a cat um, in complicated foliage um, that's uh, been deeply bred into our species by this predatory animal. So if, you, if you're going to worship anything as death, when the alien cortex starts to emerge um, and it associates <coughs> the terror of death with something, it's the cat. Um, so you have the idea of the cat um, is, is death, but it's also life. The earth gives you life, uh, the cat probably kills you. So it's, it's nature giving you life and, and withdrawing it again. And then that's personified as a woman. Uh, you're born from a woman. And then the idea is that the cat is still female-like and uh, as a goddess um, she will withdraw you again. It's very clearly embodied in Kali. So Kali, um, Kala means either the black one or the dark one or the deadly one. Um, and it's also the feminine form of the word Kala, which is time. So. Uh, our alien cortex is starting to put these concepts together, time and death, and uh, the essence, essential counting of your breath, so you an allotted lifespan. So you have in uh, a lot of the scriptures that you have an allotted number of heartbeats, an allotted number of breaths, all the, po all the way down to actually conserving your breath and breathing slower so you can live longer. It's unlikely that that will be the result. But the idea of counting down your, uh, your days are numbered and they counting down until you're killed by the mother goddess uh, is deeply entrenched 
in these early religions and becomes a kind of archetype. So Kali expresses it wonderfully because uh, she has a garland of hands around her, uh, she has a garland of heads around her neck and she has a belt of human hands. Uh, she's clearly a, a, the slayer. And in the oldest depictions, she is an emaciated old crone, um, uh, very dark skinned. And there's a reason for that. And the, the reason for that is an archetype, a Jungian archetype. So Jung uh, talks about this old woman character that comes up in dreams. And he said that that represents your, um, your subconscious. So if ever you, know, you have the subconscious worrying you or trying to get your attention in a dream, it often manifests as a, a little girl or as an old woman um, trying to harass you. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a clear personification of the early ideas of Kali. Uh, reminding you of something and essentially reminding of your, your ultimately of your mortality. You may know Carly from the Rolling Stones logo. Mick Jagger suggested that her tongue lolling out as it's normally depicted would be good for the logo and that's what it was. It was developed into the Rolling Stones signature and probably the most iconic emblem in all of pop music. So the Aryans clearly didn't know what to do about Kali. Uh, she was clearly uh, an existential threat to them. Uh, the thuggies, the, word, the English word thug, comes from the word thuggy. And for about 600 years, uh, the worshippers of Kali, um, tantrikas in, uh, in essence. So uh, tantra was uh, part of the worship of the goddess Kali. Um, these thuggies, thugs, uh, would make human sacrifices. So they would do everything forbidden. Uh, they're essentially terrorists. So they were the Aryans terrorists. And uh, they would make sacrifices of particularly travelers. Um, they, would, they would steal um, and make offerings to Kali. So there's a very telling um, Aryan story. The normal Aryan spin where one of the stories associated with uh, Kali and the, the Thuggies is that they got a Brahmin, yeah. an Aryan, and uh, the Thuggies tried to sacrifice him to Kali. But Kali turned around and was outraged that you know they should sacrifice a holy man to her, so she cut off their heads and started juggling with them and let the Brahmin go free. Obviously, Bra Brahmin propaganda story and, and the, the, almost a signature tray of how the, um, the, the Aryans would, would twist <laughs> the local legend and put out their own propaganda myth and to save their necks. <laughs> right? That's a rather cute story. Obviously, a Brahmin would have been a great sacrifice to Kali. And, um, and uh, I wonder if any of the Thuggies were, were fooled by this bit of spin. Anyway, uh, it just gives you an example of how Kali has always been a threat. The, the five forbidden taboos uh, were part of uh, Tantra. Um, you know, all, everything that the Aryans said um, was taboo was part of the ritual of uh, raising your consciousness. Uh, in, in essence, heightened tension, heightened awareness um, in, in, the, um, in the worship of Kali, Tantric practices. So. They never really went uh, away. You can still, in the country, especially in the uh, Tamil Nadu regions, uh, you can still see these shrines to Kali. The, the, the locals still worship them, uh, her as much, much as ever. And a very, very interesting character in all of this is uh, Sri Ramakrishna. So Sri Ramakrishna, um, he uh, made it all the way into the modern age, so he made it into the into the um, uh, the twentieth century, just the early years of the twentieth century. So he he just saw the edge of the industrial revolution, and um, he there are four photographs of this god man Sri Ramakrishna, who really uh, is supposed to be a Brahmin and an Aryan, and he's rapidly becoming God or Jesus Christ in um, 
<coughs> in India is being transformed. And what's so interesting about Sri Ramakrishna's story is you can see how the Christ story came about because it's being reenacted within the context of historical memory. They're redoing the Christian story with Sri Ramakrishna as the Christ figure um, in modern day uh, uh, India. And it's so fascinating because you have the same parallels of the Virgin Perth, but except they know that basically it was, you know, just uh, a bit of infidelity on his mother's part. And they still have the name of the guy who <laughs> was Sri Ramakrishna's father, but it's rapidly being erased from history as he becomes a god. But you just get a closing view um, of how the Christ myth must have come about because the Sri Ramakrishna myth is, uh, is, is following suit. So there must be some, something inside us, this archetype that we, we need to express universally. And so it's, it's very interesting from that point of view. So Sri Ramakrishna was, is a very controversial figure in some respects. And uh, there's a very interesting book um, written by this guy called Kripal. Um, he, he exposed Sri Ramakrishna as a tantrika, in fact, a failed tantrika. Um, but he really, Sri Ramakrishna really was um, a tantrika. Uh, and um, yeah, he kind of fuses, makes an attempt to fuse all of India together. But essentially, it's, it's through and through um, Kali worship. And uh, Kripal called his book uh, Kali's Child. Um, making a huge furore um, out of it, um, uh, very contentious. And I think they even attempt to ban that book now in, in some parts of, 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 um, of India as, as Sri Ramakrishna moves closer to being accepted as God. So Kali was really problematic for the Aryans. And I must say that um, over the years, Kali's been really problematic for me too, personally. Um, and I would like to share with you how I, I dealt with um, the problem of Kali and, and death. So let me tell you this story, this personal story about the kind of way that I dealt with, uh, you know, did terror management in terms of the terror, terror management theory and fear of death. So I've always had this irrational thing. I think Jung and Freud might have shared it. Um, that's a premonition that there are certain places in the world, if I go to them, I had a premonition I would certainly die. I would certainly never return from them. And the way I dealt with those uh, anxieties is to go to that place. So just to go and stare it down. So I would take a, um, you know, kind of steely attitude and say, you know, if that's the place I'm supposed to die, then I'm going to go there and sort it out now, one way or the other. But I'm not going to live in fear of thinking, oh, there are these spots all over the earth that if I venture there, um, I'll die. It's like, okay, if that's the truth, then let's get this over with. Otherwise, I go there, and if I don't die, then I'm free. So I've done this with almost all the spots that I can think of now that I've um, thought you know, these are spots where I'm certainly destined to die. I should avoid them. Um, I went to all of them and here I am. So it, it's, it was a good way to deal with uh, death anxiety of this sort. If you have it, I offer this as a solution. Now I must tell you about Carly and me. So yeah, it's, it's kind of strange, the synchronicity. If you get too deep into any of these things, um, I'm plagued by synchronicity, by the way, but uh, the synchronicity of Sri Ramakrishna and, and in particular Kali have, um, have plagued me all through throughout my life. Um, some of my, yeah, some of them I can explain. Some of my earliest memories have been, um, you know, I grew up in South Africa. My, I had a maid um, who was a Zulu princess and so some of my earliest memories are being carried by this huge black woman um, who's, who's my, nurturing me being um, a maid. She's a mother figure in my earliest memories. I'm talking, you know, uh, pre one years old. Um, so 
Yeah, it's, so Kali, from that point of view, features big in my psyche. And then continually over the years, I've, uh, for example, got um, had business partners um, that then turned out to be part of the <coughs> Sri Ramakrishna Vivekananda Society, which is basically um, Sri Ramakrishna's church uh, secretly. And I was, uh, you know, business partners for many years. Then later, um, I discovered that, you know, there was this Kali side um, to my business partner and we, uh, it came out over drinks, uh, you know, years later. And then we kind of said, you know, you just can't escape these things. We just find each other just, um, just by synchronicity. One of these iconic places that I, if ever I go to, I will certainly die, is Kali's temple in Dakshin Aswa. Um, I thought automatically I am predestined to go there one day and if I do that will be the end of my story. When this uh, business partner um, revealed that he was so uh, intimately a part of Sri Ramakrishna and hence Kali, um, he insisted on <clears throat> I come to this um, ashram and meet his guru. His guru flew out from Hawaii and during the course of this weekend retreat um, at one of the dinners um, his, his guru said that he was organizing this trip um, in the very near future to the Dakshinaswa temple in India. Padum. Um, so I said like, yeah, um, kind of thanks, but no thanks. And he said, well, somebody has just called and said that they are dropping out. I have one place in this group of people um, and really it's got your name all written over it. So I think you should come. And I tried to figure out some excuses. So I said, how much? And it was at the time I was trying to uh, launch a a business on a, on a shoestring. I didn't have much money and it was expensive. Let's say like $5,400, something like that. Um, and I said, well, okay, that's my get out. I don't have the money. So, yep, sorry, but no thanks. Um, I immediately got home and my wife presented me a check from the IRS for, yes, you guessed it, $5,400. I still don't know what the check, why the check was there. I don't know what the refund was for. It isn't reflected on anything in terms of my, um, in terms of my um, tax returns or anything. It's, it just, I, I still have no clue where this check came from. It was an IRS refund. And I said to my wife, well, the old synchronicity has cropped up once again. What do I do? We could definitely use this money. Um, this would be good for the business. Uh, it would be crazy to waste it on uh, this pilgrimage to a place where I'm probably going to die. My wife said, you know you have to go. Maybe she had a vested interest in getting rid of me. That's true. I cannot deny that. But I wound up going and it was dramatic as it normally is when I go to these places that are really inauspicious um, and I have premonitions about. So how did the story unfold? Well, we went all the way around through Sri Ramakrishna's birthplace. There was a long build up to the high point of this trip at Dakshinaswar Temple, uh, which was the final day. And so, you know, it, all the way it was brewing. There was this uh, premonitions. It was, it was, for me, it felt uh, a bit like, um, you know, Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, where it's all building up to this forum and I'm getting plenty and plenty of signals that, you know, beware the Ides of March kind of signals uh, coming, um, you know, left and right. So the omens were building all the way up. I won't go into all of them, but the, uh, I was starting to think, okay, I go to the Dakshinaswar temple, obviously this is the place I die. How do I actually die? I mean, does a brick fall on my head? Do I trip on a loose flagstone? Uh, you know, 
what actually happens to cause me to die? And I was starting to feel really encouraged because I was starting to think of the practicalities of how could it actually be? And it was probably pretty unlikely um, that just going to the temple was really going to kill me on a practical basis. And I was starting to think that was uh, my get out. Until uh, we got to the Sri Ramakrishna Mat, which was the place we stayed on the day before. Uh, that's the Sri Ramakrishna really cathedral in, in effect, in, um, just on the Ganges before Dakshineswar. So the Dakshineswar temple is, is owned by Rani Rashmani's uh, descendants. She, was, she funded Sri Ramakrishna and built the temple. Um, Sri Ramakrishna was the, the Brahmin priest in charge of the temple. Uh, it, the temple's a big money spinner, so Rani Rashmani's descendants have never let it go. And the, the priest, the Sri Ramakrishna priests now have built, they, they're rich enough and have tried to buy the Dakshineswar uh, temple many times, but they, um, they've been refused um, every time. So they built a big cathedral across the river, and that's where we stayed in, uh, what I think they call it the International House, but it's really where they put all these horrible foreigners that, um, that come and visit and try to keep them away from the monks and, uh, and isolate them. So we were in the International House, and the night before we were supposed to go down the river to Dakshineswa, and I had these thoughts about how do I actually die? Uh, this American woman who was traveling alone came um, came and stayed there. She was very, very sick. She said she had been bitten by a monkey and it looked like uh, she had tetanus. So we got the doctor in. We weren't really sure. Um, I sat with her. She was in big fever. Um, and yeah, it, I was rattled uh, because I have been bitten by a monkey before. Um, so kind of have that hidden in my memory um, as a as a kind of an omen uh, when I was a kid I was, I was bitten in a, by a monkey in Africa um, so yeah there's there's that uh, but monkeys and uh, the god Hanuman which is the monkey god was very very important to Sri Ramakrishna in fact he spent many many years naked prancing around the trees with the um, with the monkeys uh, around the temple. So there's still a huge, I think, um, mangrove tree where the monkeys live and they are the descendants of the monkeys that Sri Ramakrishna lived with um, jumping around naked, um, you know, with, um, you know, being Hanuman. Of course, try and get away with that in the West today. Uh, they would lock you up in a heartbeat. But being India of the, the 19th century, they, um, yeah, he was permitted to be the monkey god, um, jump around all day um, with the monkeys. Obviously learning psychology and the primate brain very, very well. Um, so if you, uh, if you trace back where Sri Ramakrishna developed his philosophy, you can, it's still recorded now. Anyway, I suddenly pieced together, oh dear, my death has something to do with the monkeys and probably getting bitten and dying of tetanus. So that was a bit of a downer. Uh, we got on the boat the next day, left early, went down the river, and it's a very dramatic, uh, almost like tri triumphal procession going up to the temple. So yeah, it felt like, for me, like on the road to Golgotha, uh, we get off the, the ferry boat and there's this big uh, stairway that goes up to this really, um, you know, royal road up to the temple. Uh, and on each side, there are all these fruit sellers and people where you're supposed to uh, buy flowers and things, fruits and stuff to offer um, as a sacrifice to Kali in the temple. Of course, when you offer the fruits and flowers, they get spirited around the back and ar arrive back in the marketplace again, probably within the hour. But that's why it's a big money spinner. So yeah, we get out of the boat, um, we're walking as a big group, we're in Indian dress. So I've got a chota on and sandals, but of course I've got blonde hair, I'm obviously not Indian. Um, and 
there I see the big, uh, I think it's a mangrove tree, and all the monkeys, and I think, oh, oh, this is probably it. As we walked through the, these crowds and the, the stalls, on the way up, there's the big temple looming up ahead. Um, we get to the actual tree uh, where, where Sri Ramakrishna lived with the monkeys. And sure enough, from a distance, the biggest, ugliest monkey you've ever seen in your life um, singled me out and came charging from a great distance through the people. The crowds kind of separated comes straight to me and I thought okay here it comes um, now I've got a bit of animal awareness and stuff as you do um, uh, get in Africa and I knew you mustn't look at the the monkey right in the eye I mean he, this guy took me you know up to my waist sitting on his haunches but he he grabbed me uh, by my choda um, and does this incredible, you know, just, just the blood drains out of your, or certainly drains out of my veins just thinking about it, this, this hideous, hideous face, literally the face of death, baring his teeth. Um, and so I turned my head so I wasn't looking at him. Now, of course, the, all the crowd has, has separated. Everybody is in kind of shock. Um, nobody knows what to do, but nobody's going to come close. So I kind of took charge of the situation. The monkey just kept holding me and, and kind of burying his teeth uh, aggressively. And I said to one of the party that I'm in, I said, quickly, go and get some fruit. Now, the reason I said that was because the, when I was bitten in childhood by a monkey, it was because I was eating an apple. The monkey jumped on my shoulder, bit me, and then grabbed the apple. So I thought... The, the reverse of that is to get an apple and there were fruit stores with uh, you know plenty of fruit there so you get some fruit uh, give it to, uh, to to the monkey and then that'll be enough to propitiate it so one of the very rattled members of my group hurriedly um, you know went to the fruit stall um, instead of getting fruit the rather worried uh, fruit, uh, um, fruit seller for some reason gave him a bouquet of flowers and I was in no position to really argue about it so he, he runs up you know kind of shaking behind me gives me the flowers I took the flowers and I hand them to the monkey the monkey took them is sniffed them and let go for a moment as soon as he let go I backed off and disappeared into the crowd uh, and then the commotion kind of uh, died down. Everybody was supremely, supremely rattled. Um, we talked to people later and they said they'd never seen anything like it, but I don't think they were telling the truth. So here's how I talked myself down. I rationalized it so that uh, it became livable and I could make it as mundane as possible and as, as trying you know, drain the supernatural out of it and try and find natural explanations. So, yeah, I insisted we went on to the, the temple, kind of like I wanted to see Kali and say, ha, you didn't get me. Um, and I went through the, the whole line to actually give a sacrifice to, to Kali um, on the altar. And as I got to the altar, and it was my turn to, to give over the offering, uh, a bit of money and a bit of, um, a bit of fruit. Um, yeah, I saw exactly what the monkey was doing. It, the face of the statue, uh, Kali's statue, uh, they don't like you to photograph it, but you can find photographs on the internet, and here is one. This face is the face the monkey was making. So it was making Kali's face, um, and... Yeah, it was, I think this is the way I interpret it. As soon as I saw that face, then I thought, okay, I've got what's, what's going on. Is the, and this is important to understand religion, uh, especially the religion around death and why we've succumbed to religion. Also, maybe a, 
a route out of the superstition. If you're a Christian or a Muslim and you've been dragged into these superstitions of Christianity, Muslim, the Judo-Christian kind of uh, myth um, and, and this culture, um, uh, you can get dragged into the metaphysical and um, this, is, this is the route out uh, to make it more physical and find mundane explanations to rationalize your way away from it and I would suggest that is what you do uh, because we need to get out of this forest we need to get out of this forest this predicament that got us here and this and religion was one of the ways we got here so let me go back now to Kali and that face this is what I think was happening the monkey singled me out because he's been trained We've subtly trained that monkey. I don't think that was the first time that that happened. He singled me out because I was unusual. I had blonde hair. Uh, he knew that I was probably a visitor, a foreigner, basically the, the same old thing as here in Greece, you, you, the tourists. You can, the monkey was doing the equivalent of the local shakedown of a tourist. We had trained that monkey probably through maybe successive generations to do that Kali face. Because, like me, people were coming to propitiate Kali, to propitiate their own death. In so doing, they were, they were training the surroundings to represent that death to them. So that monkey had learnt the best face and maybe... You know, there is such a thing as monkey culture and it's passed down, but he must have learnt and been trained subtly um, and unwittingly by the pilgrims that came to the Kali temple that that's the money, that's the, fa the face that basically you hit the jackpot with. And he was presenting that face to me knowing that he would get a reward and I did what most people must have done and given him that reward. So the Kali temple itself and Raj uh, Rani Rajmani's uh, descendants, they're doing exactly the same thing. They put an idol that represents a mixture of the, the black cat, the panther, and our death. And it's saying, yes, you can get out of death by giving us money and fruit. And they're, making, they're turning making a fruit stall out of it. Not a fruit stall, a money spinner out of it. So that's what they're doing up and down the, the ranks uh, with church and state. And it happens to this day in the, you know, if you go to the horror of horrors right in the center of the beast there in the Vatican, if you're a Catholic, uh, they're doing exactly the same thing. They're presenting your death to you and say, hey, give us some money and then you can escape it. Um, it's, it's not going to protect you from death, all the money that you give at that Kali temple. Uh, it might make you feel good, but it's not going to protect you from death. And it perpetuates a system that ultimately has put us in this super wicked predicament on a global scale. You can forgive it on a local scale saying, oh yeah, well what's wrong with that? You're just alleviating people's death anxiety. The problem is that you're on a treadmill of escalation. If you use a myth or a lie like that to propitiate people's death anxiety, uh, the death anxiety will expand and come back again in a new way and more severe way and you have to escalate. And so this this continual escalation has led to our culture, has led to in, in the industrial revolution. We're basically industri industriously trying to make sacrifices to Kali. Um, the work ethic in America today that, that's killing people uh, in the workplace, uh, putting tremendous stress, particularly on men, and reducing their lifespan, uh, this workaholism is really uh, the sacrifice, the modern sacrifice to Kali, to try and avoid your death, to try and get more money to shore up uh, your defenses against death. Um, and, and so it still continues today. And it, the only way to break the cycle is by understanding it and doing the kind of things that I've, I've said, which is, is basically facing it down. So ultimately, we need to dismantle the Kali temple. We need to stop worshiping uh, these, or well, not, maybe not dismantle it, but make a museum out of it, uh, to take the power out of it by explaining to people what they're actually doing. And they're actually basically using their, their money, their time and energy, and they're feeding this module that's uh, in our brains that must have come from our ancient ancestors. They're feeding this deadly black cat, represented by Kali and the Earth Mother. And 
it's only when you can tame that cat. Uh, we've come a long way since uh, we were in the Rift Valley hiding on cliff walls away from black panthers. Uh, so we've come all the way to the Egyptians where we are the masters of a cat. It's amazing that we're a primate that got to the point where we could take our worst enemy, the, the epitome of death and God, uh, and, and make a domestic cat out of it. And now it's no more threatening than the grum, grumpy cat meme. It's incredible that we achieved all that, but we still haven't uh, got self-mastery until we realize what we were doing, what, until we realize why we keep domestic cats. Um, it, it's, it's a triumph over, and it's also um, the idea that you keep a domestic cat, you have uh, God or the goddess, you have Kali on a leash. Um, so the only way to free ourselves from this kind of superstition <clears throat> this dark place in the forest we've got to is to understand it and that's what I'm helping you do um, to, to understand um, church and state uh, religion and the superstitions of the apocalypse so it's a question of identifying the villain that led us into the forest the alien cortex and then getting rid of it murdering it in place and finding our way back to sanity, finding our way back out of the deadly forest. So let's continue on that journey and let's continue on the journey of understanding. <laughs>